My name is Mike Conley, and I'm the co-author of a new book called Earth is a Nuclear Planet. My esteemed co-author is Tim Maloney in the back row there. Stand up and take a bow. And our senior science advisor is Dr. Stephen Boyd. And he'll answer any tough questions. I'll answer the easy ones. Uh, one thing I want to add to Generation Atomics' list of accomplishments is they helped us get this book published. They did a great job. They backed us up literally for years on this project. And it was a big project. Yeah. It was a big project. It took me and Tim about five years to write this book. Part-time, but anyway, five years. And uh, one thing I want to mention, um, Eric mentioned the thing about the Fukushima water release. We had Philip Holt, who's in Generation Now. Are you here, Philip? No. Anyway, uh, he did calculations on the uh, Fukushima water, and we determined that you could drink one half shot of that water every single day of your entire life, straight from the tank, prior to any dilution, and it would equal nothing more than the radiation you already get from the potassium in your diet. That's how dangerous that water is. Hundreds of news articles, protests, over a half shot of water per day that would equal the potassium that's already in your body. Welcome to the world of nuclear fear. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about a section in the book um, that we explored that I think is really important, and I think we should talk, uh, people should talk more about it. And the title of this is called uh, Nuke uh, Import Zero. I'm a writer, I'm gonna read what I wrote because I'm not an extemporaneous speaker. Um, anyway, while this is a thorium conference, and while I'm a big fan of all things thorium, I'm here to talk about uranium. Because even though the thorium that we have could power this country and the world for the next several centuries, the first phase of any large and sustained nuclear build-out will almost certainly be fueled by fresh uranium burned in Gen 3 and Gen 3 plus reactors and in most upcoming Gen 4 designs as well. This raises three key questions. Will there be enough freshly mined uranium to fuel the initial phase of a nuclear build-out? What kind of mining waste would this create? And how will that affect the perception of nuclear power as an eco-friendly, small footprint, carbon-free solution? Now, you've all seen graphs concerning the material throughput of nuclear versus renewables per terawatt hour of energy delivered. Here's a popular one. While graphs like this present a favorable picture and make us right proud of our preferred technology, they only depict the finished material throughput without considering the raw material or displaced earth from whence the finished material is derived. So my co-author Tim Maloney and I started thinking, just how much raw material is piled up behind all this finished material? We did a deep dive on this, and the details are in our mining supplement in the new book, Earth is a Nuclear Planet, which you should read along with the supplements. Generation Atomic has it for sale somewhere in the back, and if you can't find it here, buy it online. And uh, while I'm on the subject, they will also be putting out the companion book real soon. The l &T Report is a brief guided tour through the research of Dr. Ed Calabrese on Herman Muller's infamous linear no threshold model of nuclear fear mongering, uh, sorry, uh, the LNT model of radiation risk assessment. So anyway, just how much material is piled up behind all this finished material? Focusing on wind, solar, and nuclear, Tim and I gave these technologies every reasonable recycling advantage to reduce the material throughput. For example, 47% of the steel in this country is recycled, along with 34% of the copper. We also consider the fact that only 43% of uranium is what I call dirt mined by either deep shaft or strip mining, while the remaining 57% is extracted by in situ leaching. It's a process that requires no mining at all, which is pretty groovy. But whether uranium is deep shaft mined or strip mined 
or leached from underground deposits, the average ore grade at the world's top 25 uranium mines, which produce 80% of the world's uranium, is just 0.08% by weight. Now, you'll notice if you squint hard enough that the Canadians' mines have some fantastically high ore grades and some of the highest annual outputs, but their numbers, unfortunately, are outliers. We found that for every ton of uranium-bearing rock that is dug up or strip mined or leached on this planet, you can reasonably expect to yield, on average, only eight-tenths of one kilogram or just 800 grams of yellow cake per ton of raw material. Now, you don't need to be a prospector to know that this means some mighty slim pickings. And the numbers go south from there. That 800 grams of yellow cake will be natural uranium, which has a U-235 content of just 0.07%. To make a batch of low-enriched uranium fuel at the 4% enrichment level needed for a typical light water reactor, you need to increase the uranium content, U-235 content of the yellow cake by a factor of six. This means you'll need six batches of natural uranium to make one batch of fuel. To make 19% enriched HALU fuel, the high assay, low enriched uranium for an advanced reactor, you'll need more than eight times as much yellow cake. HALU is a fuel form for most of the upcoming Gen 4 SMRs, or small modular reactors, which are basically small, modular, and improved light water reactors. Fueling more reactors, of course, requires more mining. The problem is the average ore grade on this planet for uranium is so meager that even when we apply a 50% discount for in-situ leaching, the humongous volume of waste rock from digging up or scraping up the other 43% of global uranium is downright embarrassing. Yes, it really is that bad. We poured over the numbers for a solid month, and that's what we came up with. That tall yellow stack, that's the raw material from which the U-235 is derived. Now, we could cut this in half with just, if everybody had reprocessed their fuel like the French do. It's a fuel so nice, they use it twice. But even if the whole world recycled their used reactor fuel for more, more, one more round, nuclear power's raw material throughput per terawatt hour would still be about the same as solar and not even as good as wind. We clearly need to do better than this. And thankfully, there are a number of excellent alternatives. One of them, of course, is thorium, which doesn't require any enrichment, and that means a lot less mining. As John Kutch likes to say, thorium is good to go right out of the ground. Even better, thorium and uranium are found in the tailings of other mines like phosphate digs in Florida. Processing our fuel out of their waste will reduce our mining footprint and their environmental impact. So it's a win-win situation if we can get the cost down to compete with mined uranium. Now, when Gen 4 reactors come along and finally come online, we can feed them whatever's available. New or used fuel, thorium, depleted uranium, downblend and plutonium, it's all good. Because while slow neutron reactors, including slow spectrum molten salt, re molten salt reactors, can be picky eaters, a fast reactor will fission just about any actinide you feed it or turn it into something that will. Think of them as compost bins for nuclear waste. And remember, it's only waste if we waste it. But as things stand right now, alternative fuels and advanced reactors, fast, slow, or in between, are largely hampered by nuclear regulations that haven't caught up with nuclear technology. And until that happy day arrives, any massive build-out of nuclear power will principally consist of reactors that run wholly or in part on fresh uranium. Even the natrium, Bill Gates's fast reactor up in Wyoming, will run on fresh HALU fill, fill, fuel pins. Complicating matters is the fact that about 90% of the uranium we can consume here in the U.S. is mined overseas. 
That number may drop in the next few years as domestic production ramps up, but not, but not by all that much and not as fast as one would hope. Here's a snapshot of current global uranium production. As you can see, nearly 60% of the world's uranium now comes from Russia and her vassal states of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and 17% comes from Africa, where China has been scooping up uranium mines. Only 20% of global uranium is mined by our allies, and we don't even have a piece of this pie, at least not one you can see from here. Right now, the U.S. has 95 gigawatts of commercial nuclear power. By mid-century, we will need about 1,700 more gigawatts to match the primary energy grid that Mark Jacobson proposes in his 100% renewables roadmap. Tim and I unpack his proposal in our upcoming book, Roadmap to Nowhere, and compare it with an all-nuclear grid. We estimate that for a national fleet of reactors to match the performance claims of the roadmap, which proposes to decarbonize all forms of energy and not just electricity, we'll need about 20 times the fissile material we're using right now. And a lot of that material will have to be in the form of freshly mined uranium. Even first generation molten salt reactors will use a thorium uranium blend. You need something spicy like uranium or plutonium to get the party started in an MSR. So realize that fresh uranium will be on the menu and in high demand until at least 2050. And actually for a lot longer than that, since any reactor we build now should last until at least 2100. Even longer since every part of an SMR will be replaceable and most of them are designed to run on fresh uranium. So what's a planet to do? As karma would have it, there is an alternative source of fresh uranium with no mining required. This untapped reserve could power the planet with 10 billion people living at Western standards of extravagant primary energy consumption for more than 200,000 years. They should have fusion figured out by then. I ripped, I ripped this picture off from James Conklin's article. There are about 4.5 billion tons, that's billion with a B, tons of uranium in the world's oceans available for harvesting with cheap, eco-friendly, reusable synthetic sponges, and even more efficient methods are in development. But not to worry, the overfishing of ocean-caught uranium would be imposterous. Any amount we harvest is replaced by ocean chemistry, leaching more of it from, rubber, from rocks and river silt. Seawater uranium is abundant, sustainable, 100% mine-free, and 100% renew renewable. And from all indications, it looks to be commercially feasible and scalable as well. With the development of seawater uranium and the consequent drawdown of uranium mining, the material throughput for nuclear power, even with existing technology, would look more like this. Pretty good, huh? And check out the fourth item on the list. We even factored in the mining waste from digging a repository for a deep geologic storage. By recycling a used fuel and depleted uranium in Gen 4 reactors, and by not mining for more uranium, the raw and misfinished material throughput of nuclear power will be downright minuscule. As you can see, the difference is the fuel source and not the fuel itself. How's that for decoupling of the world's energy production from the natural environment? There is no way that renewables could even approach a material throughput as small as this, even if we use good old Gen 3 reactor technology, which is what we used in our road trip, our, excuse me, our road test comparison with Jacobson's wind and solar grid. Spoiler alert, nuclear winds. 
And with seawater uranium, we can also drastically, re excuse me, we can also drastically shrink the material throughput at the front end of the fuel cycle. Gen 4 reactors will leave lower costs even further while reducing the already tiny waste stream at the back end of the cycle. Up to now, fuel has already, always been a small fraction of the cost of generating nuclear power. But that may soon change. Have you seen reactor, excuse me, have you seen uranium prices lately? They're already approaching the initial estimates for commercial scale seawater extraction. Harvesting technology has improved since then, so commercialization could happen by the end of this decade, if not before. I won't bore you with the details. You can Google it. It's very cool and entirely feasible stuff. As nuclear power expands, uranium prices will inevitably rise unless the source expands or changes with it. Ocean-caught uranium could radically change the equation with the potential to power the country for centuries on end without depending on critical materials from overseas to make it happen, what we call import zero. Lucky for us, we have enough steel, chromium, and copper, and concrete to build all the reactors we need right here on the, on, uh, in the United States. But the weak link in any massive build-out scenario has always been sufficient fuel. And waiting for Gen 4 to come along is not a solution. New technology should not be relied upon to make a nuclear build-out work, but rather to make a build-out even more feasible than it already is. Developing this virtually unlimited fuel source would ensure a 100% domestic energy security for the long term, actually for the very long term, even if, even if we were limited to using nothing but good old Generation 3 technology. So it's reassuring to know that we already have the technology to transform the world and plenty of fuel to get it done. It's also reassuring to know that Generation 4 designs like the Molten Salt Reactor, our personal favorite, powered by alternatives like thorium, depleted uranium, and used fuel, will just make everything that much easier, cheaper, and better. That's it. Thank you so much, Mike. All right. Appreciate it. Hey. Well, I, oh, just, well. Three consulting, coming to your mind. I just, just want to point, point out that uh, I was just doing a rough calculation. Right now in the real world, uh, the amount of thorium that you would get as a byproduct or a waste stream from existing mining greatly exceeds 10,000 tons a year. Great. And so you would have zero mining uh, for what would be probably the balance the entire balance for that's great as long as we can get reactors run on thorium and until then you know and hopefully that'll be next year if it's 10 years from now you know whatever the point being and even if that is true which it is a lot of the smrs are basically small light water reactors and they will principally need fresh uranium or a blend of uranium and thorium and they're going to last till 2100 so like i said Uranium is going to be on the menu for a long time, yep. you know, and so we also have to consider not just forging ahead to Gen 4, but also how can we fuel what we already have, and if government regulations delay or frustrate the rollout of Gen 4 and thorium and fast neutron reactors, and if we are stuck with good old Gen 3, we got to fuel these things. So that's the approach I took. Hopefully, we won't have to do this. Hopefully, you know, Gen 4 will come along and everything will be hunky-dory and thorium and great. But all I'm pointing out here is we already have a solution and things will only get better from here. So take heart. We don't have to get the Gen 4 to save the world. We can get the Gen 4 to save the world even more efficiently, cheaper, faster, and easier. And that's my point. Fantastic, and I'm hoping that some of those technical slides you make available for some of the work I do, John does for yep. Well, I got them now. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, you got those slides, baby. All right. All right. Is there
to, to, to what extent and at what scale has those subtraction of uranium uh, been shown? What scale have they actually tried to extract uranium from seawater at this point? It's still in the developmental stage. stage. The, the point, point being is, is Steve can answer this a lot better than I. He's dug into this. Yes. yes. So it's a very, very interesting molecule. And more importantly, it's actually a polymer. Poly. Many. So to answer your question, they're already scaling up to the square kilometer scale. The active molecule is called an amidoxime very funny name if i had a i could draw the molecule in two seconds i sleep with it in my head all the time uh, <laughs> so it can grab a lot and i stress the fact that it was a polymer so you have millions and millions and millions of these units with the very special amidoxime hanging off of the main polymer as a side chain that's why they can uh, scale up to roughly the square kilometer scale right now. Uh, hi, Shirley Rodriguez. So what will be your message for the people who are actually working on advanced reactors? And as a previous designer or of, so, uh, of, of sodium cool fast reactors, including thorium, the people that are here, there's advanced, what will be your message for them to stop what they're doing? Absolutely not at all. Keep forging ahead on all fronts. I'm just saying that take heart, this is an option if it needs to be exploited. It can be exploited. So my point is, is that we already have the ability to save the world. What we're doing now will just make it even better, cheaper, faster, more feasible. But it isn't a do or die thing. You don't have to get to Gen 4, but it'd be a lot better. And we could do what we need to do if we had to with the technology we have now. That's, that's my only point. I mean, I'm a huge thorium fan and a molten salt reactor fan. Uh, don't get me wrong. All right, very good. Okay. Thank you.